Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and a very good evening to everybody joining in. Uh, so we welcome to this webinar today where you have got not one, not two, but three professionals talking about women's health. We will be talking about how we can help you in your health today when you're having your babies and tomorrow when you have finished having your babies and your life becomes even more important. So let's start by uh, discussing, uh, by introducing our, our esteemed colleagues. So Dr. Mohsen. Hi, my name is Dr. Mohsen Azam. I'm an orthopedic surgeon practicing general orthopedics for the past 17 years. I'm here in the UAE for the past six years, looking after all sorts of uh, orthopedic sports and uh, uh, other orthopedic problems. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Hiba, tell us about yourself. Hello, everyone. So my name is Dr. Hiba Malik. I'm a physiotherapy specialist here in Northwest Clinic. Uh, uh, I'm a certified orthopedic medical therapist and clinical guide evening practitioner from so I have total six years of work experience. My areas of interest are musculoskeletal, neurological, sports injuries, women health, and pelvic floor rehabilitation. Thank you. And I'm Dr. Sadia Malik. I'm a consultant gynecologist, and I've been practicing for more than 25 years, dealing only with women's health in all these years. So uh, let's uh, uh, open the floor. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim, let's start with you. Uh, let us talk about the common causes of uh, the pregnancy pains and why women suffer from these pains and how can you help them into dealing with this day-to-day -day pain? All right. So uh, one of the most common uh, complaints uh, during and even after the pregnancy, uh, which women face, is, are the back aches. So it is very common to have a back ache or a low back pain during the pregnancy uh, because uh, naturally your ligaments get softer and stretch to prepare you for labor pains. Uh, so as a result, it can put more strain on the joints of your low back, your pelvis, and you can get uh, low back pain in this way easily. So uh, that is why it is important, very important actually, to maintain a good posture uh, because as the baby grows, your center of gravity shifts forward. Uh, also, if you are lifting some, something, you have to just engage your lower body also, not just your spine. You have to sleep in a sideline position, more appropriate, use the physical agents like uh, heat and cold packs. Uh, for muscle relaxation and of course include uh, general uh, physical activity in your daily routine. Good. I'm, I'm sure that you are taking points, but I also want to reassure you that you will have a recording of this session on, on YouTube. So if you just want to listen and understand, that's, that's also fine. And I'm really happy that you mentioned lying positions because uh, sleep positions in pregnancy is a major research area these days. And as you know, Royal College has uh, recently published a very good guideline of, for pregnant women. So you can look that up also, and we will put the link in our YouTube video that you should never Never lie on your tummy when you're pregnant and always uh, lie on your on your side. Uh, so, so once the baby is delivered, then we have got different other problems. Yeah. So would you like to uh, just tell the audience how they can avoid those problems after the birth of the baby? Okay, so uh, then there uh, comes mostly um, as you are done with the baby delivery. So mostly, most of the women also complain of some general joint pains and some muscle stiffness. So again, uh, due to the capsular and the commentus laxity, uh, you can get uh, poor, you, you are prone into poor postures, uh, protruded postures, so, uh, and lack of stretchings, lack of physical activities. It can also lead towards the joint and general muscle pain. Also, it is very important to mention here that um, as soon as you are, you are done with the baby, you have delivered the baby, so mentally and physically you are occupied, right? So lack of exercise, then it can cause very early postpartum fatigue and which in turn uh, gets you into the mood swings and mm -hmm. um, lack of exercise motivation. And in turns you can get into postpartum depression. And so it's a vicious cycle mm -hmm. like that. So that is why mm -hmm. any um, postural abuse and associated complaints can never be neglected. I'm very glad you mentioned it because you see so many times mums are just, especially new mums are told that what you're feeling is very, very normal and yes, you do feel down, but you would never connect the two that your posture being abnormal or you not exercising more, or drinking water more, all these things will slowly, slowly pull you down into what is called baby blues, which can then progress into something more serious like postnatal depression. 
Uh, so again, this, that's why we're sitting here together talking about these things for you to link them together in order to uh, get into a better health. So what's uh, the main... Add, yes. Uh, <laughs> one one mo most common complaint after uh, birth, especially when women are lactating, they will come with uh, upper back pain, especially interscapular region pain. Mm -hmm. And this is most definitely due to the back position in which they are feeding their baby. Yes. And if it's either sitting on the edge of the bed, no back support, leaning, I mean, bending over the baby to uh, to feed the baby. Yes. So uh, in that case, the posture is extremely important. They should sit up straight, keep the back uh, in support, mm -hmm. sitting like on a chair with a with a high 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 back, and then you know keeping pillows in their laps to lift the baby up rather than bending over the baby yeah. to try to feed them. And that's that's because they have to wake up multiple times during the night. Yeah. And if they have a bad posture, it always leads, leads to, especially this interscapular region, pain, which is between the, between the shoulders. See, so if you're suffering from that, this is really because of bad posture than anything serious. So the root cause of that would be to go for your antenatal classes. Dr. Hiba is an expert in giving those antenatal classes where we cover all these things during the pregnancy so that you don't suffer like that after, after you deliver the baby. So I'm glad you mentioned breastfeeding because now we will come to the point after delivery, what happens uh, with, uh, with the, because of the breastfeeding. So it takes, it's the best thing to do for your baby we are absolutely supporters of breastfeeding uh, you can link any diseases and allergies and so many things uh, that the baby will not suffer and you this is the best gift that a mother can give to to a baby is to breastfeed uh, but then of course it has got toll on your body but we always advise you to take adequate vitamin d calcium during breastfeeding and the post breastfeeding years would you agree with that um Dr. Totally, actually. Because uh, you need uh, calcium supplementation, vitamin D has to be appropriate. This vitamin D should be taken even during uh, pregnancy. pregnancy. So yes. because if uh, you have mm -hmm. adequate uh, levels of vitamin D, mm -hmm. uh, it is good for the growth of the baby. Uh, also, other complications have been studied, uh, like preeclampsia with vitamin D yes. deficiency, yes. although not a gynecologist. <laughs> but you know, this, this You're is doing just, very well uh, in all the <laughs> <laughs> So, but uh, an appropriate level of vitamin D must be maintained throughout pregnancy. Uh, calcium, on the other hand, is is better uh, post uh, post delivery. Uh, usually, a normal requirement for calcium for anybody in an adult age is about 1,000 1, milligrams of calcium every day. So, uh, for uh, lactating mothers, even more so. So, uh, to maintain a level of about 1,300 milligrams. Of uh, calcium every day, and also a thousand uh, units of uh, yeah. uh, vitamin D on a daily basis. And we support supplementation, isn't it? It's really putting too much pressure <clears throat> on people to try to uh, do this with food. Yes, uh, I mean uh, dietary uh, supplementation is is one way of doing it. Yeah. But uh, usually, we cannot uh, provide the adequate levels just by mm -hmm. just by diet. Mm -hmm. uh, and always, uh, especially in special situations, lactating mother, elderly, we should be thinking about supplementation yes. on top of, of course, uh, uh, some part of it should always come from diet. Yeah. But problem is that things like vitamin D are, yeah. are rare in, in, in food mm -hmm. products. So, food products. So either you're exposing your body to sunlight mm -hmm. to convert uh, vitamin D to active form yeah. or supplementation mm -hmm. is important. Good, good. So another thing which really takes up the brunt in after a baby is your pelvic floor. And now first, first thing to mention is that people say, oh, I've had four cesarean infections, so my pelvic floor is intact. Mm -hmm. No, because it's the act of carrying a baby for nine months which really puts pressure on your pelvic floor. So if you if you put on weight and don't do your pelvic floor exercises, your pelvic floor can be as bad or even worse than somebody who's pushed four babies out, but they have been very, very conscious about pelvic floor. So whenever women come with symptoms like incontinence or difficulty in controlling urine or stools, then we advise them pelvic floor exercises and we refer them uh, to the expertise of Dr. Hiba. So what would you like to tell women about pelvic floor exercises? All right. So um, pelvic floor dysfunction syndrome, it's also one of the most common um, complaints uh, during and after pregnancies. Um, it is basically, uh, in, in very simple uh, words, I would like to explain it. It is basically the uh, weakening of 
or the damage of the muscles, ligaments, and even your nerves inside your abdomen, right? Uh, uh, though it is not uh, uh, associated only with men, women, men can also experience the pelvic floor dysfunctions, but majorly women are more vulnerable to pelvic floor dysfunctions mm -hmm. or pelvic floor injuries. Um, so the symptoms or the most common uh, of the symptoms can be uh, constipation, mm -hmm. it uh, can be pelvic pain, it can be abdomen pain, hip pain, thigh pain, low back pain, um, overactive bladder, it can be incontinence, uh, rather it's a urinary or fecal incontinence, it, it can be voiding, uh, it can be sexual dysfunctions, uh, also it can be anorectal dysfunctions. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, the muscles uh, over there, down there, they are very important and they can be rebuilt, they can be retrained because see the pelvic floor uh, muscle rehabilitation, it's basically it's a cognitive uh, re-education, uh, remolding and retraining uh, of the pelvic floor musculature so yes we cannot ignore them and yes they are fruitful yeah. so to, to the message is that uh, the birth is a acute event and after that whatever symptoms you are having come and get help for them and sometimes you feel shy in discussing this that's the biggest message on there this is the 21st century everybody's very open and honest about what is very normal to happen so come and discuss it early rather than converting it into a chronic condition which will then take longer you are very young and fit and that's why you had a baby so that's why if you have a problem then as simply seeing a physiotherapist, a gynecologist will help you as we will guide you into how you can quickly correct it. So uh, now I think I will come to another very important time of your life that when you have finished having babies and you're thinking now that's all, I'm done with that and I can just go get along with life when time then catches on with you. And something uh, called, uh, called hormonal decline then happens after you finish having your babies. Now this hormonal decline has got different uh, different words uh, that you can Google, we call it a perimenopausal area. So the menopause really starts after 50 or 51 years of age. And you will be thinking there, sitting there saying, I'm 40 and I'm not really interested in what Dr. Sadia has to say next. But this is where I want you to understand and, and know these things before it catches up upon you. Living in the times of stress, corona, many immunological conditions, diabetes, and being overweight. All these things have got a specific stress on your poor ovaries. Your ovaries are something, are, are the area which makes beautiful estrogens, which helps you to remain not only happy and have a good mood, but also it is extremely important for your cardiovascular health and your bone health. So if you are suddenly feeling these symptoms of uh, having uh, like night sweats or um, flushes or mood disturbances or mood swings and you're having a few altercations with your husband and your children and you're thinking look this is not me you know why my mood is not in my control then you might be suffering from a lack of estrogen or we can say that you are suffering from something called a premature menopause so don't just sit there and fight with yourself come and check with us and if that is the case, then the one thing that I want you to understand between menopause and taking estrogen after menopause and being pre-menopause and having a pre-menopause diagnosis, premature menopause diagnosis, and then taking estrogen is a world of difference. The estrogen that we will give you when you are less than 50 and we diagnose you to have premature menopause is something which you really, really need. And that is for your cardiovascular health and your bone health. And if you will not use it, then all over those years, you will have a decline in your bone. And I'll go to Dr. Mohsen about this, that what we are discussing now is osteoporosis, yes. which can then lead to so many problems. So would you help in explaining to our audience that if I have diagnosed them to have premature menopause and I'm supporting them to use estrogen, would you also support it as an orthopedic surgeon? Uh, yes, of course, because uh, this declining uh, uh, hormone uh, uh, thing in the body, low estrogen, mm -hmm. will, uh, of course, uh, lead to something uh, which will eventually lead to osteoporosis. Yes. So you will start to lose your uh, calcium deposition and slowly the bone density will reduce. Uh, the first stage of this is called osteopenia, mm -hmm. when you have less bone density as compared to a normal person in your age. Mm -hmm. And then if you keep 
this from uh, when you don't prevent this from happening, you will move on to a stage of osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. Osteoporosis not only just means that you have low bone density and that's okay because this will make you prone to uh, having fractures, mm -hmm. uh, which another normal person with a normal bone density will not have uh, in, in the same situation of an injury. For example, a simple slip can, can cause a hip fracture or a simple mm -hmm. pressure on the wrist can cause uh, a wrist fracture. fracture. And then the, the process of healing or you going through pain or developing a deformity will affect your life later on. And this is something that you can easily prevent by, by checking for osteoporosis or osteopenia on time mm -hmm. and then you know tracking it uh, with, with the required things, enough vitamin D in your body, enough calcium. And if you, you do have these conditions, then we also have treatments with different kind of modalities for uh, uh, for osteoporosis and osteopenia. Brilliant. So th that's what we're all trying to say is that get yourself checked that you don't really want to be that, that old lady who stooped over or you don't want, because you hear it so many times, isn't it? Somebody's mom sadly had a hip fracture. It's so common. Mm -hmm. Somebody's mom had a wrist fracture, you know. You never take it back to the fact that this was a development over 10 years which sadly could have, could, could have been avoided. Uh, so that's why it is extremely important that you, first of all, before 50 years of age, be come and see a gynecologist to be diagnosed. And please never be worried about estrogen use because it's just like I give an example of if you are diabetic, the doctor will give you insulin. If you have got thyroid problems, the doctor will give you thyroxine. And if you have got low estrogen before the age of 50, the doctor will definitely give you estrogen for you, for you to take. Um, uh, shall we check whether we have any questions? Okay. Uh, we have one for um, uh, Dr. Mohsen. Uh, somebody is asking uh, that my mother uh, has got, a, uh, she's got a very a stooped neck, a very curved neck. And they're saying that I'm very scared that will I be like her? Is it genetic that if my mother has got a stooped neck, I will also have the same? Yeah, so uh, kyphosis is what a, a stooped uh, back is called. Okay. So uh, kyphosis is, uh, is part of an osteoporotic uh, event. For example, if you have uh, some of the vertebrae, because you know vertebrae are, are rectangular mm -hmm. okay, and, and stacked on one, one on top of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the simplest fractures that can happen is because of uh, any bending injury or any axial loading. If the bone is not strong enough, it usually breaks and forms a triangle in the front. Mm. Okay, so if multiple vertebras are fractured and, and they look triangular instead of that rectangle, which was stacked on top of each other, yeah. so the bone will, the, all the bones will start to curve in a, in a fashion like that, right? Mm. Okay. So if you, you get this hump at the back, this is mm. called kyphosis. And, and osteoporosis is one of the reasons for it, especially if you never had it before and you start developing in old age. Okay. So yes, if your mom had osteoporosis and she developed an osteoporotic kyphosis, then you should be looking to find out if you have osteoporosis, prevent it. So you will not have okay. It's not genetic. Not it's genetic. it's something that was missed in that age, mm. at that time. So it should mm. not be missed in, in the new mm. uh, world. Yes, <laughs> that's what we're trying to say. That don't, yeah, uh, you know, thank you very much for that. And I hope that you like the answer because what we're trying to say is that your mom is trying to tell you the problems of her generation, which she is sadly suffering. But her having it doesn't mean that you must also have it because there are so many things that we can do uh, in this time that will prevent you. So Dr. Heba, I have got a very interesting question for, mm -hmm. for you. People are being very savvy with their questions. So somebody said um, uh, that my friend had a problem of leaking of urine after having a baby and they went and they had a Botox injection uh, for this and they're fine. So why should we come for physiotherapy and do everything? She, we will just go and have a Botox injection. Okay, so, uh, well, this is quite interesting. Uh, but I would uh, I really say that um, whatsoever a Botox injection can do, you cannot replace it with the muscle strengthening regime, of course. Uh, there are certain phases of rehabilitation for a pelvic floor or all that uh, important musculatures and the ligament stuff there. So definitely uh, Botox injection, for instance, if you have it, uh, you cannot get the root cause treated with that yeah so exercises 
proper training, proper uh, re-education, neuromuscular re-education mm -hmm. down there cannot definitely replace the Botox. So I am kind of uh, not in the support of uh, that thing that Botox can uh, replace or exercise. Exactly. And it has yes. got a sale by date. Yes. Your friend might be happy now, but you have to ask them as to what is the sale by date and how many times are you going to have this invasive procedure? And our point is diagnosis. So we have got years of experience of the fact, why are you having incontinence? That is more important to us than just saying you can have a Botox and have. So once you know uh, that this, and there's no like shortcuts to, to real problem so, so, so solving techniques. So find the diagnosis and then, and then uh, continue. Yeah, so like, as I said, you're not treating the root cause mm -hmm. by that. Exactly. So, yeah. Okay, there, so people are bringing a difficult question. Now I've got one for me. And somebody is saying that my, my, um, I have a family history of breast cancer and I have been diagnosed to have premature menopause. So my doctor advised me to take estrogen, but I refuse to take it because I'm very concerned about breast cancer. I think that's a very, very normal reaction to what you are saying. And I would also agree that I would never wish upon anybody the horrificness of having a breast cancer. But my answer to you is that, first of all, you are telling me that there's a family history. So we want to know more closely and we have to individualize your risk, your own particular risk. So who had the breast cancer in your family and how close were they, number one. Number two, there, nowadays we have mammograms which pick up very, very early cancers, which I'm sure that your family member wouldn't be telling you uh, that they have the same uh, solution. So this should not be a curtain to stop you from suffering. You know, you are suffering because you've got premature menopause. You yourself are suffering, your, your mood, your relationship with your husband, your children, your workplace. People, you know, give you horrible names and all those things if you're suffering. If you need estrogen, you must be taking it because it will help you prevent a premature death due to cardiovascular reason and a premature death due to fractures of hip fractures, which can be very, very serious and can be a cause of death. So I'm very clear in my advice that if you have diagnosed with premature menopause, you must take estrogen and you must quantify and individualize your, your risk factor. Um, I think at the end, what we will discuss is that uh, the postmenopausal ladies who are saying that, okay, now I'm postmenopausal and they are referred to me who have actually got osteoporosis but Alhamdulillah, they don't have any fractures or anything. So Dr. Mohsin, how can you and Dr. Hiba help these women who are suffering with lots of pains, especially shoulder pain, joint pains, and all of that? How, how so these you... people are usually presenting with uh, pain all over the body. That's the usual complaint. Yes. I heard everywhere. I heard everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in that situation, uh, diagnosis is, is of uh, primary importance. Uh, to diagnose, we have a uh, certain way of finding uh, the bone density. It's called the DEXA scan. Okay. So we can do that. Mm -hmm. Also, we can check for uh, vitamin D levels in the body. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, basically, calcium and uh, phosphorus uh, is uh, regulated by the parathyroid hormone. Okay. So this is less known hormone than yeah, the thyroid hormone. Everyone goes thyroid, thyroid. Yes. but nobody knows about the parathyroid. 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 There are very small glands on top of the thyroid which regulate uh, mm -hmm. this calcium deposition and uh, the removal of calcium from the body, mm -hmm. uh, from the bone. Basically, the calcium levels in the blood needs to be maintained. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have supplements or it's not enough in your, in your diet, mm -hmm. the, uh, the body will take it from your bank mm -hmm. of calcium, which is your bones. And that's what is leading to osteoporosis. Yes. That's why we say supplement so that you can mm -hmm. maintain that uh, calcium level from the diet so the body doesn't have to take it from your bone. Mm -hmm. So uh, diagnosis on, based on all of these uh, results and then uh, the most important idea is to track patients with osteoporosis, not just one event where you finally start on medication. Mm -hmm. You have to see them annually to see if their uh, bone density is going down, is, is recovering, or is, is, is on a level where it should be maintained. So only this, an annual, annual check is Yes, right? annual check is enough, uh, especially uh, when you're close to normality mm -hmm. or you're just osteopenic and, and uh, we just want to see if you're becoming osteoporotic mm -hmm. or you're normalizing. Mm -hmm. So so that's uh, something that needs to be done on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Because uh, like you said rightly that fracture is not only fracture. Uh, it's all it's very uh, commonly known that if you develop a hip fracture, uh, dying in one year of a hip fracture is 
is uh, uh, the rate is extremely high. Uh -huh. okay. So because because you know uh, walking ambulation is uh, is uh, important for your cardiovascular health mm -hmm. for your respiratory health. So mm -hmm. if you are on bed because of a hip fracture, you you're uh, stressing your cardiovascular system. You're uh, going to stress your uh, respiratory system. Mm -hmm. People develop infections, sepsis, bed sores, and uh, mm -hmm. that can lead to death. So uh, most I mean something which is preventable. We should be looking at it and then um, working to to prevent Preventive. any future disastrous yeah. events. Prevention is the thing, and and I'm sure I'm sure people mm -hmm. listening into us would know one relative, if not more, of of an older lady in their family who sadly had a hip fracture and died a very sad and slow death. And always remember that you have to think that you're a woman. Can you go through that? Do you think you are at risk of that? And then you you have to you know uh, look after. Then we have got people with shoulder pains also and frozen shoulders yeah. also that they you know, have yeah. the same thing. You think physiotherapy can help that one? Um, of course, like all these uh, conditions which you have mentioned and mm -hmm. most and also mentioned, like for instance hip fracture. So definitely the post rehabilitation phase mm -hmm. has a lot of importance and um, uh, of course nobody wants to uh, you know suffer from a uh, post-surgical complications associated with all this. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, with frozen shoulder also with hip pains or hip complaints, exercise done rightly and on the right time mm -hmm. can bring tremendous change in your overall well-being. Yeah. So a quick question to you, Dr. Okay? After After delivery, how many patients do you see with tailbone pain? That's uh, quite a common complaint uh, that comes uh, yes. uh, postpartum. And, and as uh, good you mentioned it, because you know, so many times the women are just asked to bear with it, you know. So then we have to sometimes ask direct question. So does it hurt when you sit down, you know, and then say, oh my God, it's excruciating when I sit down. So what I do, I don't sit down, I do this and I do that and so many things. So it is, it is I would say, much more common than written in the books, because it is not identified by the women as a specific. It's just like it comes in the hearts everywhere yeah, kind yeah. of a thing. So we do advise then, of course, um, an anti-inflammatory or anything. But if you can help me and tell me what you would advise to these patients, since you're yeah. a very good gynecologist, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so really, uh, avoiding pressure on the area, that's a, yes. that's a First, age or yes. known uh, uh, treatment for it. So people sitting on donut cushions or cushions which I cut out for, for the tailbone, okay. that's important. But uh, in my practice, the most important thing is uh, strengthening of the pelvic floor muscles. You know, oh. I, I advise Kegel exercise for all, oh, all uh, toxic pain. Okay. So, I think, that's that. that, I think, I think that everything, I think this uh, to me works the best more than any anti-inflammatory, okay. more than any kind of uh, yeah. for the tailbone. Yeah. Tailbone pain also Kegel, so you must yeah. do Kegel. Yeah. Kegel for everything. As I mentioned, that pelvic floor dysfunction, it's a syndrome. So it is not just related to the weakness of your muscles. Mm -hmm. uh, it is related to the weakness of your ligaments, related to the weakness of your nerves even down mm -hmm. there. So yes, definitely pelvic floor rehabilitation, which has different phases, definitely can be very much helpful in this. Mm -hmm. I just received another another question and it's uh, really I, I'm so glad that people are opening up and talking about these these conditions um the very very distressing thing that you can suffer in a normal delivery is uh, the is the uh, muscle rupture of the of your back passage which is which we call as third degree tear and fourth degree tears and they do not, uh, they not only, um, they, they're now we are talking about incontinence of the back passage, incontinence of passing the stools, or not being able to control wind. And that is the question that somebody has just asked me, that they are going through this very embarrassing uh, time when they think that uh, they cannot control wind at all, and also they cannot control very, very loose stools and they keep on having accidents of incontinence. So I wanted to reassure you that there is so many things that are out there. It doesn't really mean major surgery. Again, whatever level of uh, seriousness you have, physiotherapy will help. Isn't it? I've always seen. See, the first line of treatment, uh, I am sure Dr. Mohsen will going to agree with this, should be conservative, mm -hmm. right? You should not go for any um, direct invasive yes. interventions initially. So mm -hmm. yes, physiotherapy has the role in um, that uh, passage. That passage. Mm -hmm. Also, it's, it's pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. It's not just the pelvic muscles. It's, mm -hmm. It covers your anorectal region. Mm -hmm. It covers your abs 
us even. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, definitely you should first try all the rehabilitative mm -hmm. stages of uh, strengthening, mm -hmm. toning, strength training, everything, and then it mm -hmm. comes, uh, you know, uh, invasive in the second time. So we are very happy to report that, you know, the biggest, biggest uh, I think, uh, barrier for women is that usually our gastroenterologist friends are usually men in general. Uh, but we are very happy that uh, if we now at Northwest Clinic will soon be having a female gastroenterologist who is also an expert in this area. So you're welcome to come to us with the person who asked the question to come and see me. And I can always refer you to the female gastroenterologist. And we have now in Dubai the best ever machine which uh, in a non-invasive manner, they can diagnose exactly which muscle is weak. So then that can be targeted by less invasive procedures than actually doing open surgery or everything. So anyone out there who is suffering uh, from any of these embarrassing symptoms, please, we are here for you at Northwest. We have got different types of specialties all together under one roof, and we can definitely help you. So come and see any, any one of us. Um, as a closing remark, anything, uh, Dr. Mohsen, you would like to add to our discussion? Yeah, I think uh, we covered quite a few things. <laughs> yeah. okay. okay, here I think we are missing one of the most uh, common complaint also, which is called diastasis recti oh, in women's yes. health. Yeah. Okay, so diastasis recti, uh, basically, um, it's, it's, it's simply the opening of the muscles um, around the abdomen region, around your upper up abdomen region. So uh, it's uh, also very much uh, prone to the to the preg very much prone in pregnancies and post pregnancies itself. Right. All right, but again, yes, it can be treatable. Uh, correct exercises and it can be preventable also. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, during the time of pregnancies, if you are going through uh, you know some uh, looseness around your muscles. So you can also undergo in the strength training before your delivery. Okay. There are some modifications, mm -hmm. um, modification training techniques, exercises, which can be easily and safely done during the pregnancy period. And uh, by this way, uh, there are 35% of the chances which research says that you can prevent to the rupture of your abdominal. Muscles. That means when those abdominal walls kind of split like yes. that. And so it. normally we say that um, how it is considered abnormal, uh, more than two and a half finger gap around your uh, abdomen if it is present. So yes, this is ab abnormal and you have to address it. You have to do the proper trainings for it. So majorly the four muscles are involved in this. Uh, the deepest one is called the transverse abdominus, the deep transverse abdominus, which is like the underlying sheet or the base of our abdomen mm -hmm. then it comes the obliques which are around the side muscles and then it comes the rectus feminis oh. so which are the six pack muscles oh. yes. which so, everyone has yeah <laughs> so training of only these four muscles yeah. even pre-delivery can save you to go through that protruded tummy kind of appearance mm. and even post training uh, oh, sorry post mm -hmm. delivery you can definitely work upon that to you know to get that uh, shape back. Mm -hmm. yeah brilliant so uh, any other questions uh, we have okay uh, thank you very much we uh, just want to say to look after yourself uh, especially during pregnancy don't be afraid of antenatal classes don't be afraid of doing exercise during pregnancy and come and see people who are helping you with antenatal classes and post delivery look after your bone health your heart health and uh, just once a year, get yourself checked. Don't wait for that horrible diagnosis or that horrible fracture to happen. And we are all here to help you. Thank you very much. Please keep your questions posted and we will send you a link of our YouTube video. Thank you, Dr. Mohsen. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.